You see, this gospel message is something that I heard when I was about this big, this big, yeah, this big, this big. Raised in a family of nine children, I was dead center, the bullseye in the middle, you might say. I have two older brothers and two older sisters. And I got two younger brothers and two younger sisters, so the family a total balance. However it happened. My father, the most important thing in his life, he never stood on the platform. I think I only heard him preach the gospel once in my whole life. And then he didn't stand on the platform. He stood down there because he was scared to stand up here. I remember him one time saying to me, how can you ever stand up on the platform? Well, I don't know. I guess we just do it. But he never would. But on the second row back in the old gospel hall, there must have been about seven chairs on the row, I'm guessing, because I think there were seven of us sat in the row. Brothers and sisters, when we were younger, my mom and dad sitting at the back looking after the younger ones, but we sat up at the front, second row from the front. Gospel meetings came, gospel meetings went. I was just thinking today, you know, the influence that is placed on an individual when they watch their parents. You know, we didn't have equipment like we do today. I, we were, I was raised on a farm, a hundred acre farm. We had um, barley, we had corn, and we had wheat. And we had a little combine. It had about an eight or a nine foot um, swath on it towed behind an old tractor without a cab. You know, those days you didn't have the comforts that you do today. No air-conditioned cab out in the open, out in the hot sun, whatever it might be. I remember one day there were gospel meetings up in Lake Shore where the gospel hall is today. They used to put a tent up there every summer. The gospel hall was down the road, maybe a half a mile or so from the location it is today. And we always went to those gospel meetings. And I remember sitting on the tractor one day with my, my dad was driving it. And I remember, never forget it. I remember him stepping on the clutch. And he couldn't turn his neck. He had to stand up. He was a stiff neck. And he turned and he looked out into the west. And there looked like rain was coming. And in my mind, little boy, I'm going to escape meeting tonight. Well, we didn't like going to meeting I mean, every single night. You don't like coming to meeting all the time, do you? Your mom and dad make you come? Yeah, I did too. I thought to myself, I thought, you know, we're not going to go to meeting tonight. Dad's going to sit here. He's going to keep harvesting because he's got a crop in the field. Looks like rain coming. Well, I didn't know my dad very well. He... Put the clutch out and he pulled the tractor around. The tractor went up into the shed and we all packed up and we went to the gospel meeting. And those meetings weren't three week meetings. Don't kid yourself. Tom Letourneau was saved in a series of meetings that went for 13 weeks, wasn't it, Tom? I think it was 13 weeks. It's the gospel hall. That's the way we did it those days. You see, the most important thing, and I think sometimes we lose the effect of it or something, maybe I don't know what it is, maybe it's business, maybe it's life. Life is busier today, maybe I don't know what it is. But the fact of the matter is, we never see people going that long anymore. 13 weeks. However, went to every single meeting. Now, I was saved at this time, but when I was not saved, it was a different story. In school, I heard boys, you know, sometimes use bad language. I never used that. Never did. Never had a bottle of liquor to my lips. Tried to obey mom and dad. Never smoked a cigarette. So I'm probably better than the rest of the people, right? The boys at school that sometimes use bad language, probably they sneak a cigarette once in a while. You know, these things, you know, children alike, we're all the same. How about it, Dan? 
<laughs> so I'm a little better than the rest of the people, right? You know, there was one hurdle I had to get over. There's one hurdle you're going to have to get over tonight, too, before you'll ever be saved. And that's this hurdle. There is no difference. When God looks down from heaven, he looks into the hearts of boys and girls and men and women, he finds absolutely no difference. Sinners. Bound for an eternal judgment because of sin. The awful calamity of sin. And that's what the Lord Jesus came for. The Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. Of course, we went to those meetings, gospel meetings, in fact... There were times when we went to meeting every night except Saturday for week on, weeks and weeks and weeks. Maybe not all of us, but some of us, and I understand, I heard one time that my father had, I think it was close to three years, had gone to a meeting every single night. That's a long time. I don't know how he found the time to do it, but that was just my father. That was his, that was the way he was. I've been saved 60 years now. Except for maybe one or two others in the audience tonight, I'm probably saved the longest of anybody here. But that doesn't make any difference. The fact of the matter is, if you've been saved for six weeks, you're just as sure of heaven as I will ever be. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life so the length of time in a person's life doesn't make any difference as far as that is concerned it makes them more responsible i suppose but the fact of the matter is once a person trusts in the blood of christ they're safe for all eternity just as safe as any other person could be it was on june the 14th in 1964 our conference was in june at that time it was held in the old, in the, in the Hannah Memorial School, and I suppose there probably wasn't more than a hundred people would be there. I doubt it. I, I was little. It seemed like a great big conference, but probably wasn't all that many because when you look at a public school gymnasium, they're not that big and they wouldn't hold that many people. And I remember years, in those years, we used to, at least most of them, we never, we always went home for lunch, but in those years, they walked from the Hannah Memorial School over to the Gospel Hall on Davison College to have lunch and to have supper. Probably a 10 or 12 block walk, but they would go between meetings. <clears throat> Not wanting to go to the meeting very much, but anyway, we had to go. At the end of that conference, the gospel meeting, and I remember going out of that conference that night, and probably it was said, I don't know, more than likely it was, that, you know, the call that you should be saved tonight. And I was only a young boy, but it struck into my heart, you know. I traveled down life's road, and I was just, <laughs> actually, I was thinking about it. I was trying to find the hymn, but I used to, when I sat on the combine with my father or my big brother, and I used to, that hymn would go through my mind. The harvest is past, the summer has ended, and we are not saved, based on the words of Jeremiah 8 and 20. I remember I used to hum that all the time when I'd watch the, watch the, the wheat going into the, going into the, into the catch-up, going into the combine. I would sing that hymn to myself. The harvest is passing, the summer is ending, and you're not saved. And might I even say it today, the harvest is passing, the summer is ending. Are you saved? Do you know your sins forgiven? Are you ready? Are you ready to meet God? I come home from the meeting that night, young boy, you know, just carrying on, things kind of dropped away, dropped back. I remember my, my next older brother, he wasn't saved at the time, but he had made a profession. 
And I remember we got into a bit of an argument. I don't even know what it was about. And I said to him, I said, you're not saved. And he looked at me and he says, then he said, why don't you get saved and show us how we should act? Well, I tell you, that was like a, that was like he stuck a knife in and didn't only stick it in, but he turned it. Boy, did it sting. And it hit me right between the eyes. And I said, yes, you know, you just came from a gospel meeting. And now you're fooling and carrying on. The gospel call has disappeared. And yes, the harvest is going to be passed. And the summer will end and you won't be saved. And I began to think about salvation. I'd often thought about it. But I never thought that, you know, someday I'll get it. Maybe someday. And that night in my bedroom, lying down and looking around, I read a few gospel papers, whatever it had, but we were given a Bible. You know, you don't do it anymore because you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't bring religion into education anymore. But in grade five, there was the people, they were called, there were the Gideons. They would bring in these New Testaments, and every grade five child got a New Testament to put in his desk. You know, the Bible was important. We got up on, in the morning, when we got to school, one of the first things we did, we stood up and we recited the Lord's Prayer. Oh, well, yes, we did. It's gone now for probably 30 years, maybe more. But the fact of the matter, it was there. That little Bible in the back flyleaf of that Bible, there were a few verses. And I started reading through those verses. And at the end, there was kind of what is commonly known in the religious world today as the sinner's prayer. You know, understanding that I'm a sinner and I know that Jesus died on the cross to save me from my sins. I will place my faith in him now. And so going on about this, whatever it is, I don't know what it is. But anyway, that was in the back flyleaf of the Bible. The first verse in that flyleaf was Romans 10, or Romans 3 and 10. No difference. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The second verse in that flyleaf was Isaiah 53 and verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There was maybe another dozen verses there. I don't know. I read those verses through. I read them through a second time. Looked at them and I couldn't see anything. It was, you know, you know, when you get saved, it's like, you know, you're going to go over the corner, over the wall here, you know, and every, when you step inside of a door, the first thing you expect is that when you step inside, I'm going to go four feet off the, off the ground, there'll be a switch and you'll turn the light on. It doesn't matter how dark it is in the house, doesn't matter how dark it is in the in the building, you know, because it's always done. The electricians do it, don't they? Just inside the door, at about four feet height, they have a switch to turn the light on. Well, I thought that I could just turn the light on. You know what? The switch wasn't there. I couldn't find the switch. You know, you won't get saved just any time you feel like it. No, no. You're going to have to find the switch. And I couldn't find the switch. Reading those verses over, I finally laid that Bible down. And I remember saying to myself, you know what? You're not going to get saved tonight. You probably never will get saved. And I don't know why. I don't know why. But I picked it up again and I went through those verses. I remember hearing people say, well, why don't you put your name in those verses? And I read Isaiah 53 and verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We're like sheep. God looks down at us. God looks down at me. God looks down at you just like a sheep and you're gone astray. You're going to go your own way. They've turned everyone to his own way. You go your way. He goes his way. He goes his way. And the fact of the matter is, at the end of all those ways is life. Oh no, it doesn't work that way. And then it says, the Lord laid on him 
the iniquity of us all. And for the first time in my life, probably about 10.30 at night, as a young boy, just 10 years old, in two days I was going to be 11. Found out for the first time that when Jesus died on the cross, you know what? He died for me. <laughs> he died for me. And I placed my trust in it. I placed my faith in it. And accepted it. And that night, and I remember going to bed that night and waking up the next morning. I thought, what happened last night? I opened up my Bible. Is it still there? Is it still there? You know, it wasn't feelings. It wasn't that I felt better, felt good. Oh, I felt relieved to think that my sins have been forgiven and to thank God for doing it. But as far as having any wonderful, great feeling, you know, the next morning was just like every other morning. But there was one thing that was absolutely sure. That verse was still there. And the verse is still there today. In Isaiah's prophecy, in chapter 53, and in verse 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all, the sin of us all. And in John chapter 1, we read those words, The Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world. Friend, tonight, allow him to take your sins away. Place your faith and your trust in him. Accept him as your own personal savior. And you will be one that will swell the crowds in a coming day, that a numbered throng that will sing unto him who loved you and washed you from, our, from your sins in his own blood. Shall we pray?